Good afternoon, Fran Bissell from Hathaway Brown School. Thank you so much for coming in today and, and joining me for a podcast episode. You're very welcome, Jake. Glad to be here. Good to see you. You're a fellow Philadelphia native like myself. Um, and maybe that's Thank where you. we can start, Fran, is is your upbringing and you know, growing up in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia, and going to Marion Mercy High School, which I know pretty well, um, right down the road from Conestoga, where I'm from. What was that experience like for you? You obviously had a you know good experience at the all girls school that really led you down this road to to girls education. What was that like for you? Yeah, I loved Marion. I really uh, found lifelong friends there. I was a lifer there, kindergarten through grade twelve, and uh, a core group of of my friends were lifers as well. Um, and I guess having grown up going to an all girls school, I didn't know any different uh it just seemed that that was what was normal school for me um certainly uh I, it was uh, a privileged upbringing in, in many ways um that i had that opportunity and so i think having a strong voice or being um seeing leaders around that were all girls seeing scientists that were all girls seeing athletes that were all girls um was very empowering made me feel like i could also achieve and be what I wanted to do and contribute to a community. So it was very, um, I think that it was very defining for me. And, and, and ironically, I, you know, left school and, and taught in many co-ed places. And my two children, I have two girls, they went to co-ed schools, but I find myself back at that all girls place, partly, I think, because of Marion. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and loved it. I really did uh, love being a part of that community. And I saw, I was reading your bio a little bit, you know, before we came in, you, you have 15 siblings and 11 sisters. So you really know, you know, um, uh, what it's like, sorry, we're just moving something here. You really know, uh, you know, what it's like to be a girl and being around girls and growing up with girls in your family. I mean, 11 sisters, what was that, what was that like to grow up with that in that in the household? Um, well, <laughs> again, you kind of emerge from your family not knowing it's different from everybody else. I just thought everybody had laundry baskets full of socks in their laundry room and, uh, you know, did kind of a lot, ate a lot of pasta. Uh, we, it was a, a lot of <laughs> chaos and fun, and there was always a sports game going on outside. I think, you know, we had a full court basketball with subs growing up because there were so many of us. Um, uh, and uh, I also appreciated, too, that always different opinions, right? And so how do you synthesize a group of people who um, have, you know, different different thoughts or different perspectives on things and so grew up in, very much in a big family with a lot of strong voices? Um, I have, yeah, so I there were 12 girls and three boys. It was a, it's actually a beautiful love story. My mom and dad had 10 children and my father passed away when I was in high school. And my mom met a man whose wife had died. So he had three children, she had 10, and as if they needed more, uh, they had two more. And so it was a his, hers, and our story. And you know, Jake, you talked a little bit about um, Marion. I think one of the reasons I loved my school is that there was a lot of change and, and some real sadness that happened in my high school and then also some real joy when my mom got remarried. Um, and through it all, that school really um, helped me uh, develop the, the, the resilience um, and um, the ability to move through uh, grief and find joy and, and be surrounded by friends and caring adults. And so I feel um, I've become a, a strong woman partly through my family experience and my, my school experience, but they certainly intersected in high school in, in a very meaningful way. Yeah, that's something that stuck out to me reading about you a little bit was at Hathaway Brown, you came into the position of head of school with the idea of creating a, a community and a sense of belonging and family at, at that school. And, um, you know, you're talking a lot about your own family and your upbringing and how Marion as a place, you know, going to that school for your whole life really, you know, set you up with that mindset that the school can be a, a family and a community. Yeah, you know, I ran a school in Vermont uh, for nine years before I moved to the Hathaway Brown. 
And um, when my girls went to college, I knew I didn't want to stay in a small little Vermont town by myself. I was going to miss them too much. <laughs> and so I kind of said, I need more girls uh, and really thought about, OK, when they go and, and have their strong wings and fly um, you know, down to their journeys, where what was the next chapter of mine? And so um, I knew exactly, you know, it's funny, I looked only for all girls schools and applied to three, which um, all great schools. And the moment I walked in HB, I knew, I knew that was the one. I knew this was the place I wanted to be, um, you know, my second home. And I think for many heads of school, um, school is a little bit of a home, a second home. Uh, coming from boarding school when in, early in my career, I certainly felt that realistically. And so, um, uh, coming back to an all girls place just felt like a really great match for who I am and what I believe in, in, uh, about, you know, female voices and leadership and, um, achievement and well being. Um, and so it's been just a fabulous seven years. I've really enjoyed it. That's awesome. I would love to, um, to talk a little bit about the culture at Hathaway Brown HB. Um, and, you know, at Gilman, I teach all boys. Gilman's an all boys school. But one of the cool things about Gilman is that we have Bryn Mawr and Roland Park, which are our counterpart schools, you know, right across the way. They come over for 11th and 12th grade humanities classes. So, you know, I teach at an all boys school, but all of my classes are co ed. And I hear similar things from my female students about their schools and, you know, what it's like to be at an all girls school and kind of the culture at Bryn Mawr and Roland Park. And that's something that I've thought a lot about in my career so far. I'm in my fifth year here at Gilman. Um, but what is really the culture at HB like um, in terms of it being an all girls school and you know, I, I was reading about some of the leadership programs that you have there and how leadership is such a key component to your mission. Um, but I think it'd be helpful just to hear a little bit more about the culture and the the daily life at Hathaway Brown. Sure. You know, it's it's um, uh, HB is the oldest uh, girls school in the state of Ohio, founded in 1876. And actually where we are today, uh, um, physically in Shaker Heights is the sixth place for Hathaway Brown. It used to be in Cleveland uh, downtown. And as it, it's, you know, had its little uh, stops along the way, uh, it, it eventually moved to Shaker Heights in the 20s um, when the Van Schwerinins, the people who were kind of uh, developing Shaker Heights, uh, gave a lot of the schools, the private schools that were downtown, free land to build. And so the university school, which is the boys' school, uh, there's Laurel School, which is another great all-girls school, Halfway Brown. We all got these kind of tracts of land in Shaker Heights, and uh, the developers kind of developed around it. And so that sense of neighborhood and community is actually built into the fabric of how the whole Shaker Heights was founded. And HB was founded originally as a boarding school. It was a boarding school from 1927 uh, to probably 1970. And, um, and then the, the old dormitory became a primary school. So while it was always K-12, it started to grow and the boarding component ended and they expanded uh, the primary and early childhood programs. Um, and so what's nice about it is it's all one campus all the buildings are kind of linked together. And there's that sense of early childhood through grade 12 on just on in you know one space. So familial is really what it is because it's not like there's a space for the just high schoolers or a space for just you know primary. Everybody uses the same gym, the same cafeteria, the same classrooms. And so you're passing children of all different age, uh, you know, girls of all different ages all the time. So mm -hmm. Big girls are looking up to, to leaders and looking down to the little ones and inspiring them. You feel really important if you're in fourth grade and you're the head of the primary school, but you know then you're also looking at the middle school girls and what they're doing. And so um, very sweet and unique that you have so many developmental ages under one roof that are enjoying that sisterhood together and that familial sense 
really defines HB. And I do think there's a lot of that, how architecture also contributes to culture. Mm -hmm. A lot of living rooms kind of uh, interspersed throughout the building so that there's gathering spaces for girls of all ages, very inclusive. Um, I do think where we are relative to the, the other suburbs, it just feels, we have girls from 80 different um, towns in Northeast Ohio, um, wow. 30 different languages spoken at home. Wow. Um, and so really, uh, really a beautiful diversity that enriches um, kind of what it means to be a part of the HB community. And we, we like to say it's a celebrated community because there are so many, um, many different layers to it. Um, we just had our heritage dinner the other night uh, and it was just amazing. I mean, literally with 30 different languages spoken at home, you can imagine the dishes, you know, from Poland to um, Israel to, um, you know, uh, South Africa and just uh, Australia, uh, Sweden. Uh, it, it's really kind of amazing. And in some ways, uh, the, the um, really strong hospital and educational systems in Cleveland have attracted so many different people from around the world, pretty global. And um, that's also a nice piece of, of who we are today, pretty different from who we were way back when, but still, still a family, so. That's really cool. I like how you, um, you know, 1876 was the founding of the school. You kind of reach back into the to the roots and the beginnings and the traditions of Hathaway Brown. But I also love how you have this forward looking lens. I was reading a little bit about the Institute of 21st Century Learning that you have at your school. And that really interests me because I taught a, um, you know, I've been teaching, I teach American literature to juniors and I had some issues. I live on campus here at Gilman and I got back from our winter break and I had, you know, this huge flood, a pipe burst in my house. And, you know, I was kind of scrapping to figure out what do I do? And I was very lucky that, you know, living on campus, I'm renting. So Gilman took care of a lot of the, the issues with that. But I realized, you know, there's so many life skills and things that I want to be able to teach my classes. You know, if you're, if you're, you have a flat tire, you get in a fender bender or just things that pop up in adult life that you don't really deal with when I didn't even deal with in college because you just kind of show up to the dining hall in college and you show up to your dorm. And if something breaks, you know, somebody else fixes it. But I want to teach some of those life skills and the 21st century learning um, institute that you have at your school seems very fascinating in that in that same way. Yeah, it's, you know, it, this uh vision of um, knowledge and action predates me. Bill Chris, the former um, uh, reti retired head of school, really wanted to, uh, he saw that girls most, for the most part, were pretty good at the academics, right? I mean, pretty good at school. And putting knowledge in action is a very different skill set. And leaning into that um, and creating opportunities to, to do that here in Cleveland, um, may really enhance that overall kind of learning for life, which is our mantra. And so it started out with a uh, science research and engineering program. And many of the labs down in case really um, had opportunities for girls to be a part of that research. And so um, they, a lot of, probably 80 or so girls a year would go down and do high level science research with the scientists um, in the labs at Case or even at the Cleveland Clinic or University Hospitals or NASA. There's a, 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 a NASA lab in Cleveland as well. And it wasn't just like a mini experience, it was actually two full years of research experience that then got them enough data to be able to publish a paper and that depth of knowledge and mind you it was volunteer you didn't have to do it uh you weren't getting a grade for it so it wasn't an experience that was graded it was just something girls actually thought was cool and wanted to do and this idea of uh low risk no grades but really interesting opportunity to put knowledge in action became kind of a whole institute and now we have business and finance so for example, on campus, we have our own coffee shop. It's like a, basically a mini Starbucks. 
but the whole business is run by the high schoolers. So there's the CFO, the CEO, each head of HR, head of payroll, all that, all those skill sets of running a business um, through this coffee shop, the girls learn. Um, the board decided to put uh, $30,000 of HB's endowment into um, a uh, investment group made up of the girls. So just like we hire an investment manager to manage our endowment, we, get, we empowered these girls to put their economic um, knowledge in action and understand if you were a part of an investment group, what would that look like? Um, and so um, it also extended to uh, the writing center where they you know, publish a magazine and they have um, a whole bunch of online um, newspapers. Uh, it extended to um, the sustainability fellows where they actually helped to build and, and, and uh, transform some of the building as part of the um, um, construction management team. So they weren't necessarily building with a hammer, but they were a part of conversations about budgets and architects and planning and, you know, planning boards and how do you go through the process in a city to, you know, put an addition on your house or, or renovate um, and do so with the idea of LEED certification. So the girl, so when your your school building becomes a little bit of a textbook on how to how to to do that. So all of these opportunities were really created by girls who said, hey, I think it would be cool if we managed some of the endowment. I think it would be cool if we had our own coffee shop. And I think we've been able to be highly responsive to some of those entrepreneurial ideas and create learning opportunities. Um, so while the adults um, around are helping to make it happen, I really do believe it was the girls' voices that created the momentum behind the behind the uh, fellowships. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and and you know, I've been showing my classes just videos in the first five minutes of class of different life skills like personal finance and you know how to change a tire, as I said, just different things that they you know might need to to know or or know about someday. And um, you know, I, I think it's cool that how excited the girls get about these different programs. Like I was after a video we watched on, you know, I think it was uh, CPR. We watched how to do CPR because I don't know, you know, if the high school students know how to do that. And that certainly could come in handy in, in some points in their life. And someone in the back of the class was like, oh, we're going to learn how to do our taxes. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's like th they're excited about learning these real world skills that may become you know, really applicable to them in their lives. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, that extends, I think, too, to um, one of the things that they do here, because there are so many older girls and younger girls, uh, some of the older girls are part of our daycare. Um, and also their AP psychology class kind of looks at child development through those lenses and to, to better understand kind of how to raise kids, but to do so with a psych psychological lens and to understand those, you know, those milestone moments, those those important growth spurts, or what does it all look like before you actually uh, become a parent? So I think there are m multiple opportunities when you look at knowledge in action, you know, whether it is, you know, do your taxes or personal finance or, you know, it, what they do in AP psychology. Um, and I think leaning into that, listening to the girls where their natural interest lies has made it such a success. So, so is this, really fun. is this program all volunteer? Like do girls have to choose one um, focus during a semester or a year? Or is it just all girls who kind of have a, um, you know, a region in mind that they can pursue? No. So, uh, you know, I think now there are, we've changed the name from the Institute for 21st Century Learning to fellowships, because I think fellowships here in this city of Cleveland really connote um, higher, more specialized learning, like a, like a fellowship in medicine. And since Cleveland has so many great, great um, hospitals here, uh, we've tried to really use that, you know, natural language that's a part of our landscape. So I think now there are about uh, nine or 10 different fellowships you can do. Most girls, again, it's all voluntary. If you want to do it, it's here if this is what you want. 
most of the girls love doing them and uh they have they do at least two if not three sometimes girls do four or five of them um they're really excited so one of the opportunities is global scholars which is taking a trip and doing a lot of research before to understand uh the culture you're going into i think they're going to korea or zambia um this summer they've gone to india and japan they've done uh, a couple trips to to europe as well but the idea that you go and um, you kind of become embedded into the culture. Um, one of the rules of a global scholars trip is you're not allowed to bring your cell phone. So it's kind of really being present in this culture and understanding it. Um, and some girls choose to do a global scholars fellowship. Um, some girls do business and finance and some do uh, you know science and research. And some try to fuse that together to do some sort of science and research project abroad, you know, um, that they can fund in some way. So, you know, it's it's really, it becomes very creative. Uh, there's a fellowship called Action and Equity, and some of the girls, uh, d you know, want to start their own nonprofit, or um, they want to become uh, advocates for a nonprofit and do different things. Um, so I, I think what's fun, or what's really empowering about us is, is that it's not prescribed. It almost is like a, you know, a palette of lots of opportunities that they can figure out on their own what they what, what they're really excited about. Um, and very popular. And a lot of people choose HB because of the fellowships. Uh, I think that that's a nice thing. It's a nice compliment when you have such strong academics to be able to put that knowledge in action right away. And so it's really the, the it's the it's the nice connection between those two that I think make it um, really attractive to, to many, many girls. I love it. That's awesome. Um, so as the school leader, um, what are some of the challenges or issues that you feel like you have been thinking about most recently or just this year um, that provide your job with, you know, difficulty, but also um, excitement on, on a day to day level? Like, what are you kind of working through this year? So, um, gosh, uh, we, one of the more fun and slash challenging things is we're currently renovating campus. Um, we had, um, a master plan that had five, five kind of parts to it. And we're on the fourth piece of that, which is renovating, um, our primary and early childhood part of the labyrinthy building that all, that's all connected. And, um, what's been interesting about that is um, Shaker Heights has lots of rules. Uh, they didn't really want temporary um, classrooms or trailers to take up parking spaces because we wouldn't be good neighbors in this neighborhood. And so we've really had to rearrange where things are. And that's been uh, a challenge and, and at the same time, the most amazing opportunity. So what usually is an upper school area has become you know, little spatterings of primary school classrooms. And so there's a lot more interaction between the older girls and the younger girls. So um, that has been a beautiful thing, but it's not perfect spaces for the younger girls. Um, we've had to uh, do a mid-year move from one wing to another wing, shutting, we shut down one wing, everybody was out of it and we've had to move mid-year. It's a lot to ask teachers to move mid-year. And um, they did so gracefully and beautifully. And the students were so excited. Uh, they had these little, it was mostly our three, four and five year old students. And they had their little tiny mini construction hats and wrote their names on the floors before they got it covered with car the carpet. And um, so they felt ownership of it. It was really sweet. So renovation and the logistics thereof have been um, difficult and then when you have logistics of that, you're always thinking about safety. I don't think there's a head, head of school not thinking about how to make a campus the safest possible campus. And, you know, with girls, I think that that comes to mind perhaps even more for parents um, just to make sure that their young girls are safe. So we've been looking a lot at safety um, always. And then I think the third uh thing that we've always been talking about this year was, you know, how do we make sure that we can uh, attract and retain the very best teachers uh, and, a, and a diversity of teachers um, and, um, you know, make sure that we can pay them what they deserve. This is, 
you know, just amazingly soulful work. Um, you need a lot of skill to do it. And uh, we want to make sure that we um, have the best and can keep the very best. And so work really hard with my board to, to be able to make that happen. Great. So this might be a sort of generic question, but it is interesting to me because, um, you know, I'm working at an all boys school and I feel like there's certain skill sets and things that you might look for when you're hiring at an all boys school that would differ or not. I don't know. I'm curious to hear your answer to it at a all girls school. So when you're hiring a teacher or a faculty member, what are some things that come up in conversation that you really are attracted by, by candidates? Like, what do you like hearing during an interview from a prospective candidate at Hathaway Brown? Sure. Good question. You know, um, I would say HB starts from a position of strength. We have incredible master teachers here who have been teaching 30, 30 plus, almost 40 years. And these master teachers can really help young people develop the skills necessary. And I do think like a Malcolm Gladwell, I think 10,000 hours makes a difference in a classroom. And if you have more experience, you naturally can build a skill set that and, and a couple tools in your toolbox for the different learners that you will meet on on your journey as a teacher. And uh, so again, I, I really feel like I have an incredible group of senior teacher leaders who are tremendous, which means that we can when we're looking for new teachers or we're looking for people to come and join HB. Um, I'm looking for joy. I want I want to hire happy, joyful people who love kids because I can probably help get con you connected to people who can help you become the best teacher but you can't really teach somebody who to love kids if it's not in their soul mm -hmm. and you can't you know really, really teach somebody how to be genuinely joyful and happy to be with kids each day and so uh, really I think it's such a gift to have so many outstanding uh, teachers and I think also to be in a place that really values joy um, and emerging from, you know, uh, the last couple of years where uh, the pandemic uh, certainly made schools not necessarily joyful places. I don't think that can be, you know, um, I, I don't underestimate joy when you're looking for uh, outstanding teammates. I think that that's a big piece of how, how we want our girls uh, and our students all to feel about their school experience, um, that, that, that learning is, is joyful and curious and fun. And, and we should do, uh, you know, our mantras, we learn not for school, but for life that, you know, learning for life is, is, um, is a wonderful way to be curious about the world around you. So uh, I think joy is, is really important. I also think in different departments, <clears throat> You know, you don't want people all at the same age. So history, you, te you teach uh, history. I actually taught history early in my career, too. And it was nice to be in a department that had lots of different levels. You know, the conversation was just um, just uh, uh, more productive. You know, young teachers can ask really good questions. Um, and older teachers can learn from younger teachers, whether it's new ways of assessment or technology or um, new ideas. And so having uh, multiple different kinds of experience levels in a department is a positive dynamic in teaching. So I think that that's also an important piece of hiring is not hiring always this, you know, all new for, for your English department, but having us, you know, having a lot of different uh, experience levels. So. Right. Um, I think that's a really good point about joy uh, in teaching. And I, I think, you know, you brought it to, you, you brought up Malcolm Gladwell. I think that's so important when you're trying to be good at anything is, you know, you can't be a good teacher or a good head or, you know, I played lacrosse in college, a good lacrosse player. I know you played field hockey, good field hockey player. If you don't, you know, if you don't love it, right, you're not going to put in those 10,000 hours. You're not going to spend the time if you right. don't get some enjoyment out of it. Absolutely. And it enjoys contagious, you know, and, 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 you know, you could argue the other thing being joyless can be contagious in February, dark February months before spring break in, in schools. So, um, 
you know, I think it's important to find the, the energy and the, you know, the happiness that is contagious. Yeah, I like that a lot. And and at Hathaway Brown, you guys have the um, Penn Fellowship Program, right? I think when I was leaving yeah. my second year at the Penn Fellowship Program, Hathaway Brown had just started or entered the program. Yes. You know, what a great program. And I think that that, that program, too, looks to link and mentor, you know, uh, senior teachers who have lots of experience and new green teachers who have joy and how do you begin that journey with, you know, and I think uh, my daughter also did the Penn program at St. Paul school in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, and she was a, a Spanish fellow there and she learned so much. Um, actually, one of the funnier moments was she was in her, one of her first um, faculty meetings and she texted me, she goes, wow, I didn't recognize that your job was so complicated. <laughs> it made me laugh that, you know, faculty dynamics in the beginning of school year and getting something up and running and finding a theme and um, that she was all of a sudden seeing it from a professional side and not just her, her mom coming home from work um, <laughs> made me giggle. But uh, the Penn program is such a gift and uh, such an investment in, in being an authentic community of learning. And I love to do how so much of that um, kind of work on being a school of belonging, of understanding how diversity can be a huge strength and to understand privilege in, in those ways uh, uh, also really helps the conversation at schools and helps us grow. And so uh, uh, it's been a real treat. Did you tell me about, did you love the Penn program? I mean, what was the best three things that you got out of the Penn program? So that's a good question. I'm very grateful for doing that program. I I did an internship at Choate, uh, Rosemary Hall, during my junior year of college, yeah. and I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to be a teacher. I just thought, oh, this is an interesting opportunity. I can keep doing English, which I love. You know, I was an English major, and I could I could share that with some people, and and I can continue with lacrosse. Lacrosse has always been a big part of my life, so that those two interests combined with each other made for a great summer opportunity. And that's when I heard of the Penn fellowship program when I was finishing up those, I think it was like six or seven weeks at Choate in the summer. And I also was like, this place is unbelievable. I went to a public school it was a great public school, but looking at Ch Choate was the most like beautiful campus. I think I've ever seen even more beautiful than most colleges to me. And, um, I was like, yeah. if I could do this, that, that'd be awesome. And, so I heard of the Penn Fellowship. I applied to a bunch of the different schools in the program. And I thought it was really impactful in terms of mentorship and not necessarily the mm -hmm. professors or the classes, which I did get a lot out of, but going to those weekends in Philadelphia and at different schools and just, just being around experienced teachers and hearing some anecdotes from all of their years of experience in the classroom I think went a long way. I think having a mentor at my own school, so Brian Ledyard, who is now the um, incoming head of the upper school here at Gilman, was my mentor, and I kind of just followed him around for the first couple of years and learned from him. And um, I think that was great because I had a reduced teaching load. I could focus more on observing, which I think is important in your first couple of years of teaching. And really the other thing is, the impact of technology because a lot of the Penn Fellowship program was virtual. You know, it was online. We yeah. had Zoom conferences. And when COVID hit and so many people were freaking out about using technology and Zooming and putting up a Canvas page, I was kind of all ready to go for that. I was teed up right out of the program, which was an unexpected benefit to it. But it also kind of worked in my favor as a teacher because I was pretty, pretty savvy coming out of that program with the online tools. So I loved it. I was very grateful for, for doing it and, and then staying on at Gilman. It was a, you know, it was a pretty lucky uh, first job, you know, that I'm still here and, yeah. and had a great experience. You know, I, and yeah, I think mentors um, are lifelong impactful. You know, I think that, that you're right. It's, that's not underestimated in, in, um, how certainly they affect rising teachers and, and teachers and lots of studies have been done on that. 
My One of my mentors early in my career uh, was a woman named Emily Jones, who became the head of Putney School. And she recently retired, um, I think last year. Anyway, I still keep in touch with Emily. I, I feel like, you know, I mean, it's been almost 30, 40, 30 plus years since I was a new teacher way back um when and i can remember distinctly kind of following her around as you said and learning from her and watching her and thinking about even how to ask a question or why you would ask it this way versus that way how that would affect you know a teenager or a conversation and uh she was just brilliant um and my first head of school that i worked with a gentleman by the name of lance Auden was also very um, helpful and impactful. And I think he was one of those mentors that t told you what you needed to hear, not necessarily what you wanted to hear all the time. And that was really helpful to hear the, what you needed to really work on. And I find that those kinds of conversations as a head of school are really important ones. It's it's good to make people feel happy and appreciated. And But if you really want people to grow, you also need to tell them how and what to do and to work on. And and to do so with grace and, and with a depth of empathy and understanding. But he was very good at telling me what I needed to hear. And there were lots of ways I needed to grow as a young teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know the Penn program kind of probably started, started those kinds of conversations, which is also very helpful to get that feedback. Yeah, you know what I think is is really maybe of utmost importance as a young teacher, at least for me, was exposure to so many different types of teaching and coaching styles. And that was a benefit of that program, but also a benefit of just Gilman in general. I got to work with a lot of different coaches and a lot of different teachers here and observe different styles. And what I realized is there's no real one right way of doing things as a teacher and a coach and a mentor. It's like there are so many different styles and, and ways to build relationships with students and, and players that that all work. Yeah. Well, and, you know, being an athlete, right, you have it in your mind that, you know, I'm going to master this kind of position or this kind of, you know, game that we're playing here. And the reality is with teaching is it's that you're more the coach than the player. And uh, you've got to figure out how to reach all these different learners in your classroom, which, you know, means creating a, a, a plethora of tools to be able to, you know, reach each different way somebody's thinking. Um, and certainly that transition from athlete to coach and, and, and coach to teacher um, was, was a part of my early years teaching and, uh, and certainly profoundly affected my lifelong development as an educator. Yeah, I'd love to actually hear a little bit more about how, you know, athletics. I saw you played m multiple sports, too. I mean, field hockey in college, but I've read you play golf. You play, you play different sports. And maybe how competition and athletics have kind of carried over into your professional life. Because that is one thing that I, I kind of had to figure out when I first became a teacher, because it's not – a very competitive profession in some sense, you know, if you teach a class, you're not going to get a, you know, you're not going to get a trophy or anything after the class, if you, even if it's a really good one. Um, and I'm used to that, you know, being an athlete my whole life. And I've got a lot of friends that are doing things on a day to day basis that are, that are competitive driven. And I think that's why athletics and coaching is a good outlet for that type of, um, you know, need for certain types of people, but I'd love just to hear more about how sports have kind of carried over into your professional life. Sure. You know, and, and again, back to my family, you don't, you're not, if you're a part of a family of one of 15 kids, you know, at some point you're playing to win. It may just be the cookie <laughs> that's left over for dessert. Right. And so I think being a part of uh, a big family has, has made me a little competitive. Um, so I'm not so sure it's my athletic background or my family upbringing, but mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, my husband, Dave, would say, yeah, she, she plays to win. Um, and I do think um, um, it's, it's a little less about teaching, but I do think uh, as a head of school, um, 
you think about fundraising and you think about being a part of conversations where, you know, um, people have the opportunity to give a lot of different nonprofits or meaningful um, ways to give their money away. So why are you going to give it to Halfway Brown? You know, what, what distinguishes or differentiates that? So in playing, quote, playing to win, I think you want to make sure that you have the argument or at least know what the interest is of that donor to be able to say, you know what, we're a great match because you, be you believe in championing women. You believe in entrepreneurial spirit. You believe in creating opportunities for girls, right? So how do you, um, you know, maximize uh, the, the uh, advancement revenue stream? I also think independent schools are more competitive uh, with each other uh, naturally for great students and trying to find the right match between a student and the mission and the school. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely a little bit of a competitive landscape. Um, and I think, you know, people in independent schools, unlike public schools, can vote with their feet if they're not happy. And so I think really being a good listener and understanding how uh, your constituency, what, what is their vision and what is their want as they look forward in, the, in, you know, to actualizing the mission in the next five years or so, you know, kind of getting a sense of that vision. Is that that, that kind of athletic kind of vision like where are we going how what what's the next next step so some of those things are a part of my head of school world i think um and and not only that i, I mean I, I i i love working out i love running i love uh playing tennis and and you know the giggling golf stories i'm not so good at golf so it's more, it's got to be more giggles than golf um I, uh, so, you know, being with friends, you know, having some downtime, that's healthy. And mm -hmm. certainly to be able to demonstrate that as a head of school, to have that nice, you know, working on fa the balance of, you know, you know, work and play um, and joy uh, is important um, piece of leadership as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And maybe one of the reasons why sports are so emphasized you know, I, I would say, I don't really know what it's like at Hathaway Brown, but at Gilman, you know, you've got to play a sport. And, you know, some people may not be, you know, the, the biggest athletes ever, but I think sports teaches you certain skill, life skills that it's very hard to get from other areas. You know, what it feels like to lose or to come up short or how to handle a win even. I think, I think those are very important character builders for men and women. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think we, you don't have to do a sport at HP, but so many people do. And I think the idea of sport has expanded too. I mean, we have a robotics team uh, and we have an esports team and we have a debate team and uh, you know, lots of ways to be uh, competitive or at least to work collaboratively towards a common goal competitively. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I like that those are, absolutely team opportunities um besides a field hockey team or a tennis team and um but we uh, i think there's a lot of girls who have a lot of blazer pride we're the trailblazers uh shortened blazers and um uh we blazer nation there's a lot of pride for a lot of different folks we were actually we're just out this past weekend i was at the ice skating team competition and there's a team dance that happens i've never seen that before my girls were ice hockey players but there's a it was really great um a team uh a, a team dance i love Sweet. that yeah that's great and uh, you know i was thinking that too i went up uh, with a model UN crew to uh, New Haven a couple weeks ago and just the teamwork that they showed, you know, it's very equivalent to being on a field or on a court or whatever. It's you're working together to, to achieve something. And I think that that's so important for character building. For sure. And, you know, the arts does that too. Um, our orchestra at AP is relatively large and that would be a lot of uh, coordination and teamwork to make, make a performance happen. So I can see some of that in our arts as well. Good. So fr Fran, um, we've been doing the podcast for a couple of years now and we started it during COVID really, because first of all, I think we we're kind of bored. There wasn't really much else to do. There was no afternoon schedule and 
really a lack of connection because we were in such a crazy time. And um, it's been an awesome experience. And Chesra and I kind of worked together to talk to different coaches and teachers. And ever since I talked to our head of school, Henry Smythe, I've been talking to different leaders of schools. And um, you're actually the first person I've spoken with from an all-girls school. And the other four or five heads of school have been either co-ed schools or all boys schools. And I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit more. I know you have already, but what it's like to be a leader, a head of school at, at an all girl school. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I think HB is, has such a, an amazing uh, history of championing women. I think we have, um, students who um i think when you leave hb you don't realize what it was like to be in this all-girls space um until you you know you go to college and uh for a chunk of time i was a college professor at uni the university of vermont and i always knew the girls the students in my class who came from an all-girls school because it was um they just had a stronger voice or could assert themselves more. And I think that that's a really amazing gift that you don't necessarily discover until, until a little bit later. And so um, I think in some ways, uh, whether you're at an all boys school, all girls school, co-ed school, being ahead of school is, you know, you have revenue streams of advancement and admissions, you have, you know, management of endowment and board and you have hiring and all that other stuff. Um, but if I were to say what makes HB really special that it's all girls is it's just, a, it's really people who want to champion each other. And there's a powerful network of alums that are, um, that want to help the next generation of HB leaders kind of break into their field or, you know, on their journeys or, Hey, I remember when I had just gotten, you know, out of college or, you know, in this. And so what is amazing is this network of just um, kick-ass ladies who are ready to help the next generation find their footing. And, um, and I love that about HB. And I think that's a ver very much a hallmark of all girls schools is that kind of women championing women. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, that's really special. The other thing that's interesting, and I, I, think about my days at Marion, and I don't think this is the same there. I wonder if at Conestoga, if you have uh, that, but a lot of alums come back to want to teach or be a part of HB after they've left. Um, so many of our board members uh, are, you know, over 60%, I think, of our board members are alums. Um, and so this kind of idea of giving back to a community that gave you so much, you know, belief in yourself, confidence, power, voice, um, is really an important piece of, of what it means to be a part of an all girls school. And so that's been, that's been just really, um, just an amazing treat and, and, um, just privileged to be in that conversation and to witness so many of those stories happen. I love that. Do yeah. people from Conestoga, like, are there teachers at Conestoga who went to Conestoga? Is that like a thing? Because that's kind of a thing here, but I wouldn't say it was a thing at Murray. Um, I'm not sure about Conestoga, actually, but it's one thing about Gilman that has always struck me is that so many mm -hmm. of our teachers here are alums and, um, and they stay yeah. on for a long time. You know, it's like there are teachers here who have been here for 50, 60 years. And it's like, you, you've you got to love the, there's got to be something really, really special about the school if people are coming back after they graduate from college. Almost, you know, sometimes they come right back after graduating from college and they want to share what they've learned and give back to the school and, you know, belong to this community again, even though they, you know, they left for a couple of years to go to college, they're right back. And there's really something special about it if that's the case. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, so I, I, I would agree. It's just, it's very similar here and are the uh, boys school down the road U S has very similar experience too. So there must be some kind of secret sauce in, in the culture that, you know, creates that stickiness uh, that people want to be a part of it. And I think that that's maybe what our, our 
mission says too is you know go and be a part of something larger than yourself to you know be a part of a community or a cause or or you know an important endeavor that um you know creates momentum you know positively in in the direction and many of our uh, alums go and become you know all sorts of things doctors lawyers uh, we've got a pretty big medical community here so i think that that's one of the beeline um um places that people feel really proud to, to, to be a part of. But some of it has also come back to HB and that's also very valued and, um, and, and we're very proud to have so many alums a part of it. Now, did you always know that you wanted to go into education and, and become a school leader or was this something that you kind of found out uh, during your career? Oh, good God, you know, no. Uh, you know, thought, well, I'm one of 15, if I'm the oldest of a big family, of course I'd become a teacher, right? Like that would just be so predictable. <laughs> and so I think I fought it for a long time. You know, so, and I think many athletes have a story like this. I, you know, I was a sophomore at Boston College and totally blew out my knee and um, it was a career ending um, uh, injury and trying to figure out, okay, I love field hockey. I love to compete. You know, what do you do next? And of course, the next thing you say, yeah, I'll coach. And so um, while at BC, I applied to be uh, a JV field hockey coach at Newton Country Day School for the Sacred Heart and got the job. And I was like, wait, getting to coach these kids, these girls, this is amazing. And so I think you know, I probably would have played and not pursued education, but because of a silly knee injury uh I, all of a sudden i got to be a coach and then that kind of led to um you know next my next job teaching and i think i chose boarding schools partly because i you know you were talking about you know how do you pay your taxes or how do you fill out you know buy a car or mm -hmm. you know rent an apartment um there was so much chaos in my family at these moments and i thought well i'm not moving home because that would just be coming a full-time babysitter post-college so instead i went to a boarding school <laughs> which would be a full-time babysitter uh so i think it was <laughs> uh just unfolded that way um and i loved being in the boarding school i loved teaching coaching i coached basketball field hockey tennis i loved teaching history i loved being a part of that community and I was there for a decade and um, totally just loved being a part of that. And I think that that just, you know, kind of unfolded the way it was. But had you told me before my knee injury that I was going to be a teacher, I would have said, no, 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 not me. Um, and but that was the, at Taft, the Taft, right? Kind of. Was that it was a Taft, Taft, yes. Yeah, it's funny. That's. Yep. Yeah, a lot of teachers do have that story of just getting into coaching. That's kind of mine too. Is I, I was doing lacrosse lessons, and I was like, "Oh, this is you know, this is fun. I enjoy this." What if it was you know with a subject as well, kind of a twofold um, career path, and just kind of worked out. So that's awesome. Yep. So one thing that we do with the podcast is I I usually ask guests to bring a book recommendation or think of a book recommendation Ooh. that they've read recently or just in their life that had an impact on them and i was wondering i don't know if i told you this in advance but is there something that you are reading currently or have read in the past that really had an impact on you or that you still think about today sure you know um this year we've had two authors come and visit hb um, well, one was a woman named katherine sanderson and she just came she's a professor at amherst uh, and Small Worlds Collide, she uh, is on the board at Camp Dudley, and Camp Dudley was a part of my journey as well. So uh, she wrote The Positive Shift, uh, which I'm uh, reading right now, and uh, she was just terrific. Um, and then um, the the other author that came is The War for Kindness um, uh, author. What's his first name? He's really great. I'm going to forget his first name. Of course, I didn't think about it, but... Uh, he uh, war for kindness. It's um, um, Jamil Zaki. That's who it is. And he came and he, that's a great book too because it's about um, a lot of the science and psychology behind developing cultures of empathy in schools or in workplaces, and the idea that you can 
uh, lean into creating, you know, more empathetic communities. Um, and I thought he was, uh, he is a researcher at Stanford. So both of those are, I just think are, were amazing books. Um, the Lincoln Highways on my, on my spring break list, mm. uh, kind of excited about, about that one. Um, but I, I, I tend to do more nonfiction than fiction. Um, and, uh, anyway, those are the, the latest two, the upswing. And I forget who that's by, but that was a, a book too, that recently came out. Um, and, um, talking a little bit about data and, um, how, where we are as a nation, what are the signs that we're actually on the right track versus the wrong track? So maybe finding the silver lining in, in things, um, as, 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 as we unfold, I don't, I don't need any bad news in my life. So I find <laughs> back to who am I hiring joyful people? What am I reading joyful books? Uh, I think maybe that's uh, the product product of being ahead of school these days is there's enough negative and nasty that lands on your desk. So find your journey to joy and, um, and, and, and fight for it. I love it. That sounds awesome. And the positive shift seems like, I mean, the cover just stuck out to me, but is that about happiness and positivity? Yeah, I think it's about mindsets. You know, Carol Dweck talked about mindsets and I think uh, Catherine Sanderson really takes a lot of that research and, 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 you know, how do you uh, look at your perspective and, you know, intentionally shift it so that you can find a positive side of things. And that's not to say that, you know, when you're too positive or too joyful, right? You, you want to be realistic. I mean, but I think, um, I think she was just talking about kind of daily life. You have kind of sometimes two choices, the glass half empty, glass half, you know, full. And how are you leaning into or what psych psychological ways can you um, um, craft uh, situations or, or classes or a problem or something that uh, gets people more motivated or more excited to lean in versus less excited. Hmm. And um, I think she, she was really um, a really great storyteller and really practical. And so in some ways, kind of practicality of changing attire, right? Practicality of understanding your mindset to create positivity. Um, she's really, she's really good. Great, thank you so much for those. And I'll just get, I'll just share a, um, a, a recommendation with you. And it's it's, it's called yes. Waking Up Podcast, and not even a podcast. It's a waking up app, and it's mostly meditation. Sam Harris, um, he runs it or he organizes it, and he's an interesting figure who I I like listening to speak. But it's a lot about you know the important things in life. There's a new series about mindfulness for young adults that I use with my classes today for five minutes. We did a mindfulness meditation, but it's this full app about a lot of what we're talking about, kindness, happiness, um, safety, different ways of looking at the world. Um, he does speaker series. He's got a lot on here and I don't usually pay for apps and, and there's a free trial that you can do to see if you like it or not, but I gladly pay the hundred bucks or whatever it is for the year with this app because I use it all the time. And, um, you know, if you like mindfulness, meditation, different ways of thinking about things, I think the waking up app is a good, good thing to try out. That's awesome. I will definitely try it. Um, oh, that's me. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today on the podcast. It was great to see you. Great to hear from you. And, um, hopefully we can talk again soon. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, Jake. Have a good one.